as of right now, we are live, but it takes a few seconds for these settings to propagate through Zoom. Okay, so that is coming in now, and let me... Okay, yeah, I think we are good. Waiting on give it just a second to, to let the other people come in from the last session. Oh, numbers up into the high, numbers up to 50. All right, there we go. I think that's everybody. All right. <laughs> Welcome back for the second to last talk of the evening, day, day one. Um, very exciting. Uh, very, very happy to have have with us uh, Mel Andrews, who's doing some really cool stuff right now on uh, on philosophy and machine learning and formal approaches to biology. So this is really uh, uh, stretching, actually, in in the direction of our next talk, which will be about philosophy of mathematics. So we're going on the little the little formal tangent for the end of the evening. So I, I like this. Um, this talk is on uh, machine learning and the scientific method. So uh, without further ado, Mel Andrews of the University of Cincinnati, I will be happy to give you the floor. Take it away. I'll do. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about machine learning and the scientific method. Um, specifically, I'm going to look at what the literature on scientific modeling can tell us about how machine learning behaves in science. Um, so this is sort of the map of what I'll be talking about today. Um, the inputs, what I'm bringing to the table are um, machine learning, uh, the literature in philosophy of science and scientific modeling. And um, my experience over the past few years has been uh, specifically with this model called the free energy principle, um, which is, has its own sort of complicated history. Um, so that's what I'm bringing to the table. I'm gonna look at um, descriptive and normative aims in understanding uh, the role of machine learning in science. And then I'm gonna hope that this gives us sort of a, an overall broad brushstroke picture of machine learning in scientific practice. So first, machine learning. Um, a definition computational technique for big data analysis that generates a statistical model of the data on which it's trained, given the instructions of an algorithm. Um, now, today, there's not a lot of analysis in the field side literature on um, machine learning and scientific practice so far, but um, it's been addressed a little bit um, by the likes of Colin Allen, Cam Buckner, Catherine Creel, uh, Margaret Helena, Tina Linnelli, Carlos Sednick. Um, scientific models. Um, the science uh, model-based philosophy of science um, as a literature, it uh, embraces sort of the messiness or disorderliness of science, um, but it's sometimes done so at the cost of being overly permissive. I find there's a there's a big emphasis on pluralism, and um, that uh, sometimes leaves open important questions. Um, so a lot of, uh, most of the, the ink has been spilled in, um, in this literature so far on, on giving typologies of models, always attempting to give sort of exhaustive typologies of scientific models. And then kind of uh, arguing over the ontology of models and the representational status, how, how it is that models represent systems in nature. Lastly, the free energy principle. Um, so this is a formal model that's currently a, relatively new, right? Um, it's currently uh, being used in neuroscience, psychology, cognitive science, and biology. Um, and it's built up from machine learning methods. Um, so the, the original, um, the, the core of the framework is coming from um, a method known as learning with noisy weights or ensemble learning. Um, this is coming from like Hinton um, talks in the in the um, the eighties and nineties, and you can see it um, perhaps best articulated in McKay's work. Um, and and some of those methods that are involved in the the FUP, um, the free energy principle, are are coming um, also from physics. So there's a, there's this interesting sort of um, historical trajectory where you get. The, the techniques developed in physics and then they're brought through machine learning and then 
brought into a, a model in biology or neuroscience. So they, they've gone through like multiple fields, multiple domains, many, many different interpretations to get where they are today. And this method has generated a lot of um, like controversy and confusion. And, and I think that's the case because there's a lot of uh, what's been called reification going on there. And I'll say more about that. So descriptive and normative aims. Um, there's sort of a, a mapping project here and an, an anatomy project here um, that we can get from the modeling literature. Um, a taxonomy of models, variety of different types of epistemic virtues at play in different sorts of models. Um, and hopefully this will allow us to answer the questions, um, how does machine learning operate in scientific practice? And how does machine learning help us predict, explain, understand, and manipulate target systems in nature? But there's also a normative aim, right? We want to be doing not just mapping, but but kind of preparing ourselves to do intervention where need be. So there's a, I hope to also get from the the literature on scientific modeling, from philosophy of science, the tools needed to do uh, diagnostics and and surgery when we see that um, when we see that machine learning methods are are going awry, when we see that they're somehow disease. Right. Um, so how do we identify problems in scientific modeling with machine learning? Um, and then how do we go about analyzing them and ultimately rectifying them? Um, to that end, I'm going to look at a problem that's unique to scientific modeling um, known as reification. So on the anatomy slide, um, I'll just say briefly, I'm, I'm going to draw these distinctions very briefly, um, just so you have them in the background. Um, there's a distinction between models and target systems. Um, there's a distinction between theory models and data models. Um, there's a distinction between structure and control. And then there are sort of lower order taxonomies of models. Um, so models are taken to be abstract structures that enable investigation into real world systems known as target systems. Um, Often this is said to be done by representation, right? We take a, a model to be representative of a target system. Although some people have a more kind of pragmatic conception of, of what it is that models get us, right? What, what purchase they give us over target systems. Um, modeling involves necessarily um, idealization, abstraction, distortion, simplification, uh, coarse graining, black boxing of irrelevant variables, right? Um, and the famous quote here that's sort of representative, it's, it's not from a philosopher of science, it's from a statistician, um, George Box, but um, it's sort of representative of how the philosophy of science literature takes models to be useful. Um, all models are wrong, some models are useful, right? This is a very uh, Wimsadian position. Um, his, his famous paper on this is um, false models as means to truer theories. Now there's um, a distinction as well in the literature between theory models or theoretical models and data models. Um, so a theoretical model or a model of a phenomenon um, is going to represent a worldly process or phenomenon. And it's gonna be informed by theory. It's gonna be, it's gonna be conceptual. Um, data models, on the other hand, are when we take um, raw data, so to speak, that we've collected, and we clean it up, we remove outlying variables, we remove um, any kinds of errors, and we find a rough first pass way to organize it. That's what a data model is, right? We do, um, for example, cleaning and curve thinning. Um, now, I think that we can see, uh, and this is, you know, this is tentative. This is my, my first pass attempt at, at um, applying what I've learned from this modeling literature to machine learning. But I think on a first pass, we can see that there's sort of an analog in machine learning and how it's used in science with this data model, theory model distinction, right? Um, so on the data model side, um, we see that machine learning in scientific practice can, um, for example, sift through data, discarding 
um, what's very interesting. So for example, the, the, at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, there are um, machine learning models at play that are um, sifting through uh, particle collision events and keeping only you know, the, the 1% that are most likely to be interesting for us. Um, machine learning can also classify data and that will maybe sometimes fall on the theory model side, but it may also in general fall on the data model side. Um, data models can um, find simple patterns in data. So for example, linear regression is a data model type thing that we might do. Um, and also we can generate simulated data on the basis of existing data. Um, if we were generating simulated data on the basis of, of theoretical considerations, this would be more of the theory model. But if we're if we're looking at existing data and generating from those patterns there for other cases, that's a, a data model type thing. Um, on the other hand, the theoretical model side, um, machine learning systems can can be taken to be representative of target systems in the world. Um, they can be taken to be representative target systems uh, literally, straightforwardly, right? Or um, maybe approximately with uh, some idealizations um, and analogically as well. Um, structure and construal. Um, so the idea with this is that models are composed of, um, this, is, this is Michael Weisberg's typology, right? Um, we have physical, mathematical, or computational models. And, and physical and mathematical and computational refer to the structure of the model, right? What the model is composed of. Um, but what a model consists in is both the structure it's instantiated in and a scientist interpretation or construal. And it's this interpretation or construal that relates the model to a target system. So this is what's drawing the kind of comparison between the model structure and some system or systems in nature. Um, and perhaps this breakdown is best seen in the case of what we call model transfer. So um, model transfer is uh, our, our term for when we develop a model in one domain, in one discipline for one purpose related to one target system. And then the structure is imported to a new domain or a new discipline and related to a new target system with a new construal. Um, so for example, the lock Volterra model, it's a, it's a system of nonlinear differential equations. Um, it was first used in, in physical chemistry um, by Lotka. Uh, and there, right, the, it's, a, it's a sort of oscillator model, right, of a type. And it, it represents um, chemical concentration, right? But then it's imported later into um, population biology and ecology. And it's, uh, it's used as a predator prey model. So instead of representing um, chemical concentrations, it's representing populations of organisms. Um, so it's known as model transfer when, when the, the structure, right? So the system of nonlinear differential equations is brought from, from a context of physical chemistry to a context of population biology. Um, there have been a few types of, um, I guess, like lower order typologies of models that have been really helpful to me in understanding um, the free energy principle over the past year. Um, my, I, I've been, I've been thinking about the FEP for several years now, and really my breakthrough with it was thinking about it in terms of this uh, philosophy of science of modeling literature. That was what really enabled me to finally, uh, I think, get to the heart of it. Um, and for that reason, I think that um, looking at that literature for understanding um, scientific modeling with machine learning techniques in general is going to be a really fruitful avenue and, and a good first step towards understanding machine learning in scientific practice. Um, there are a few types of models that I think particularly accord well with the roles that machine learning can play um, as sort of theory models in science. Um, these are uh, exploratory modeling. So 
there might be a, a domain that's wholly new to us where we we don't have a lot of evidence and we don't have robust theories built up. And in order to kind of get a foothold there, in order to to just get in the door in that new domain um, with that new uh, sort of area of investigation, exploratory modeling, um, it doesn't build in a lot of assumptions. It sort of casts a wide net and enables us to, with minimal assumptions, um, work out what sort of systems we're dealing with, what the parameters are, what's relevant, what's not relevant. Um, target list modeling. Um, Weisberg looks at uh, targeted modeling, um, target directed modeling, um, rather, and uh, generic modeling and target list modeling. Um, and target list modeling is modeling where um, you don't have a specific um, target system in mind when you go about the modeling process. And I think this is a, another good candidate for understanding machine learning. Um, Barandiran has specifically um, a kind of typology for um, life-mind continuity models, and particularly um, these are all computer simulations of life-mind continuity theories, right? Um, and he gives us an account of generic and conceptual modeling there that I think um, fits really well. And then um, Tari Shmara has this notion of, of uh, models functioning as guides to discovery. Um, and I think all of these are good avenues for understanding um, machine learning and scientific practice. Um, but on to the normative side. Um, there's this notion of reification in the modeling literature. It's only been really so far rather scantily diagnosed, um, but there's been some talk in, in um, Lavin and Lavin and Lewinson and um, in Vinto's work um, on uh, what they call reification or conceptual reification or pernicious reification. Um, reification occurs when we make category errors in wielding or interpreting scientific models. Um, The dialectical biologist, um, Levins and Lewinson, tell us that abstraction becomes destructive when the abstract is reified and when the historical process of abstraction is forgotten so that the abstract descriptions are taken for descriptions of the actual object. Um, there are many distinct components to modeling, right? Um, the idea is that uh, modeling is going to help us relate theory to the world. Um, but models themselves, we've seen break down into a structure and a construal. And then our access to the world is always mediated by data, right? We don't have access to the world out there, but just data we gather from it, right? So um, in scientific modeling practice, we have to be careful not to confuse theory and structure and construal and data and world. And yet we seem to all the time in scientific practice. This is the, this is the chief pitfall of scientific modeling is that we confuse some level of this process with another level of this process. Um, and I'm gonna highlight for us um, the six primary types of reification that I think we see commonly in modeling. If I can change that. The first um, type of reification we see is, is sort of the classic case of mistaking a representation for the world. Um, so Korzybski gives us um, this famous quote that I'm sure we're all familiar with, the map is not the territory, right? Um, when we have a map of the world and we confuse the properties of that map for the world out there, for the territory that we're traversing, this is this first order type of reification. Um, this is where the existence qualities or results of a model are taken as facts about the target system. Um, and Levin tells us that models, while well, they are essential for understanding reality, should not be confused with that reality itself. 
The second order type of reification um, is when the existence or qualities of a model are mistakenly attributed to a theory. Um, so this has happened uh, a lot, I've noticed with the free energy principle where um, the formal structure of the SEP, um, that is the mass, uh, is conflated with um, a theory of brain function or biological self-organization. Um, so Ramshed, Bax, Clark, and Friston tell us that systems are alive if and only if their active inference entails a generative model. Um, but here what active inference and, and generative models or generative modeling refer to um, is, is math. Um, and what, what, uh, what it is to be a living system, right? What, what life is, what the dynamic of life is, is, is a theoretical construct, right? And the idea that, um, that this math is going to tell us in and of itself um, whether systems are alive or not um, is, is sort of a category mistake, right? The math can't tell us that. Um, we, can, we can build a conception up from that math of, of, um, of what it means to be alive, but that doesn't flow as a direct consequence from the formal techniques, right? Um, Famously, Karl Popper made a similar mistake in the 20th century. So um, he, he developed his conception of the theory of evolution by natural selection from looking um, at, uh, at mathematical models, right? Um, there was a, there was a, in, the, in the 20th century, right, there was a, especially in the first half of the 20th century, there was a surge of um, mathematical models of evolutionary processes. And um, Popper developed this logical conception of, of these um, of, of the theory of evolution by natural selection from looking at this kind of secondary literature, right? Um, and particularly these mathematical models. Um, and he said, uh, well, it must be the case that evolution by natural selection um, is not a scientific theory, but is in fact a metaphysical research program because it's, uh, its structure is pathological. Um, According to these these formalisms, we cannot differentiate realized fitness from from this sort of abstract ideal of adaptedness. Therefore, it must be that evolution by natural selection, Darwin's theory is a tautology, right? If he'd developed his notion of evolution by natural selection by reading Darwin himself, he wouldn't have come away with this, right? But he's imputed the the um, the qualities of the mathematical models with the theory of evolution by natural selection. And later he recounted that and said it, he was mistaken, but it's a, it was an interesting debacle in the 20th century, right? Um, the third type of reification um, involves taking some features of an interpretation of a model um, and confusing that with the structure. Um, so we might relate a model to a target system and uh, lend it an interpretation and then claim that some metaphysical conclusion follows analytically from, from the math, yeah, from the structure, right? Um, and basically to, to, have, um, to have philosophical conclusions, to have metaphysical conclusions, to have theoretical conclusions, we need a, we need a construal. Right, we need structure plus control, structure plus interpretation. Right, um, it's it's common to try to pull metaphysics from math, and math alone does not get us metaphysics. It doesn't get us ontology alone. It needs the uh, it needs the addition of an interpretation. Similarly, it's it's common to try to pull um, facts or or knowledge from. Uh, from the model alone or the results of the model alone um, without relating the model or the results of the model back to gathered data, to measured data. Um, it doesn't work. We need, we always need um, the contribution of data to be able to say that we have knowledge of a natural system, right? Uh, a simulation alone, um, unless you're plugging in data, a simulation alone does not give us knowledge, 
right? We always have to relate, relate our models and the results of our models back to something we've measured in order to have knowledge of the natural world. And this is a common mistake, right? This is a very common mistake in, um, in evolutionary biology, right? We see this all the time where we're, we're doing modeling work and we claim knowledge without, um, without checking against data. Um, the fourth type of reification um, is when in interpreting or applying the results of a model, um, we forget to de-idealize. We forget to acknowledge or compensate for distortions that we've introduced in the modeling process. Um, so for example, um, when we build a scale model of a bridge, um, some of the properties of that model are gonna scale linearly. They're gonna scale up to the actual um, engineering feat that we're trying to accomplish, right? But other properties, for example, some, some like structural properties of material do not scale linearly. And we're gonna be in big trouble if we assume that everything scales linearly, right? Um, they're they're gonna have to be like scaling coefficients at play to make sure everything um, works out when we go from the scale model to the building of a real architectural system, right? Likewise, in biology, um, we're in doing evolutionary modeling. We're often making um, simplifying assumptions. For example, we we imagine an infinite unstructured population, or we imagine um, like discrete generations, non-overlapping generations, um, and we know these not to be, you know, true of of real populations. Real populations in nature are finite; they are structured. Um, they are, uh, we have overlapping generations, right? So, so when, we, when we do that modeling work and then relate it back to real systems in nature, we have to remember that we've made these simplifying assumptions and uh, parse those out so that we get something that's uh, realistic, that corresponds to, to what we observe in nature. Um, the fifth form of reification, um, this is particularly the case in the cases of um, model transfer, right? Um, so this is when a construal of a model in one domain is misattributed to the construal in another domain. Um, so we interpret, we, we develop a model in one domain, we bring it into another domain, relating it to a new target system, but we're, we're uh, falsely carrying over um, aspects of the construal from the first domain inappropriately into the second domain. So um, annealing, uh, we, might, we might be um, forging a sword and uh, to, get, right, to get the right lattice structure of that sword to make sure that it uh, is robust, that it's not gonna break. Um, we can't drop the temperature all of a sudden. We have to, we have to do this slow process of um, bringing the temperature down um, to get to get the lattice structure to form in a way that's uh, that's um, free of the kind of abnormalities that would lead it to be more susceptible to shattering, right? Um, but we also do simulated annealing. So when we're doing machine learning, right, um, uh, and we we want to learn a feature space um, that's a uh, it's got a bit of a finicky topology, this, this feature space. Um, um, we find that, that using like a, a simple backprop, simple like gradient ascent um, we are, we tend to find ourselves landing in local minima. Um, and so we want to um, do a simulated annealing where we're, we're, we're playing with the temperature of the system, right? Um, where temperature corresponds to um, how how big the jump it's taking on, right? The the magnitude of the vectors it's taking in, in gradient descent, right? Um, so we're playing with the the temperature, quote unquote, um, to get this uh, machine learning model to find a a global minimum, to find an an optimum value, right? Um, 
but here temperature is analogical, right? In simulated annealing, we're not referring to the real temperature of the physical system. And it's, it's common, you see all the time that people actually think um, things like we're actually, uh, the computational system with the physical computational system we're using, we're actually lowering the temperature on that. This is the kind of mistake we see people make all the time, we see modelers make all the time. Um, and this kind of mistake is is um, common, very common in the free energy principle literature, where we take um, we have borrowed uh, models by analogy from the physical domain, right, into uh, a statistical context, and we take them to have um, the original uh, physical meaning, right, like energy. Uh, and we take it to refer to actual energy, or we take temperature to refer to actual temperature, that, that is physical temperature, right? Um, so construal in one domain is mapped to construal in a new domain, right? Inappropriately. They're appropriate like metaphorical mappings, right? But um, reification here happens when, when that uh, mapping is, is somehow pathological, when it's, when it's leading us astray. Um, the sixth and final form of reification um, is when data are, are naively fed to a model or the output of a model is naively interpreted, um, such that the modeling effort doesn't always state, but in fact obscures causal facets of the target system. And this, I think, is probably um, our, our biggest worry in machine learning in science, right? Um, this is really common in large-scale statistical models. Um, diagnosed, um, for example, uh, Lewinsky in, in, in 1974 um, does a really close analysis of ANOVA, analysis of variance, um, showing that oftentimes what we're doing with this model, right, this, this model gets us uh, variance, it gets us, it gets us correlation, right? Um, it doesn't get us fundamental underlying causes. And we're often trying to use this method to, to get at causes. We're often, in interpreting the results of an ANOVA, we're often interpreting these causally without license. Um, and, you know, in, in the preliminary work of machine learning, um, we see really kind of pathological um, uh, reification in this respect where we, um, we have uh, rough hewn correlations in what we've observed. And we take these to get us at some kind of underlying causal factor that doesn't exist, right? Um, we have uh, phenotypic variants and we, we think it's getting us at genotypic variants when, the, when we know genes not to work like that. Um, that sort of thing, right? So um, I think that uh, paying attention to reification is going to be really important um, with machine learning um, for a number of reasons, um, right? Machine learning systems are in some sense complex and not widely understood. Um, what they're harnessing is in some sense, what, what machine learning systems are harnessing is in some sense like very rudimentary statistics, like, like DOM statistics, right? Um, which is not difficult to wrap your head around. Um, but what we're using machine learning to do is um, data analysis at a level that, you know, the human mind simply cannot do. It's doing things that we cannot wrap our heads around because we just cannot process data of that magnitude, right? Um, so it's going places that in some sense we can't. Um, and yet we can do it, we can, we can employ machine learning very conscientiously, right? We can, we can understand what it's doing such that we can debug it. Um, some of us not understanding uh, machine learning comes down to it being um, oftentimes proprietary. Uh, in, in, a, in a lot of contexts, the machine learning systems that we're using are not available to us because they are um, corporate owned. Um, 
Another problem that arises is that um, we might have a system that's a, a black box, right? We, we talk about explainability and understandable, understandability and um, transparency in machine learning systems. Um, we might have a system where we just know the inputs and the outputs, but the, um, the underlying rationale for how that system has gone about categorizing or dealing with that data is unknown to us. Um, it may also be that data is perhaps mishandled or of unknown provenance, right? Um, we don't always have control over where the data is coming from and, and um, what's been done to it, you know? Um, and if, if the data has been improperly gathered or improperly handled or improperly, improperly fed to the model, um, we get all sorts of problems. Um, we also know machine learning systems to be very sensitive um, to noise and to artifacts. So they're easily fooled. Um, it's it's easily uh, it's easy to to um, lead a machine learning system astray, right? Um, so in all these senses, um, machine learning in science is is ripe for this kind of reification, right? Um, we don't know what's going on under the hood. Always, um, maybe we're maybe we're we're trained as you know astrophysicists or population biologists or or what have you, but we we are not trained as um, programmers or statisticians or machine learning engineers in the way necessary to really get what's going on here. Um, it may be that. Um, even if we do have a, a good high level understanding of what's going on, um, the system is simply unintelligible to us. It's simply um, doing things that, that we cannot penetrate, right? Um, and so on and so forth, right? It may be latching onto artifacts that we don't know about. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think we can learn a lot from this philosophy of science literature on modeling. Um, I haven't, uh, I haven't necessarily argued uh, a strong um, philosophical thesis here. Um, that wasn't really my intent. Um, my intent is more to um, open up a conversation about machine learning methods in science and what the tools we already have at our disposal, for example, the modeling literature is able to do for us here, how this is able to elucidate machine learning in science um, and what the pitfalls will be, like what, what we need to watch out for in, doing, um, in going about machine learning in science, right? And I would like to see the philosophy of science literature sort of um, take up this gauntlet in a strong way, um, both in terms of uh, getting ahead on, on classifying machine learning in science, and, and really most importantly, getting ahead on um, figuring out how to identify problems with machine learning, figuring out how to de debug machine learning. And I think um, understanding the perils of reification is really important. Um, and I hope that uh, in delineating what I hope to be sort of the main uh, types of reification in science practice um, with models, that uh, this will give us some headway. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Questions are rolling in. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and get right to it. So let me start with a question from Brady Fullerton, who asks, who says, really enjoyable talk. Thank you. Uh, but then asks, how would you address concerns in machine learning over whether the practice must resemble models of the scientific method strictly? For instance, you discuss machine learning as an exploratory model, but what do you think of the temptation to see machine learning as needing to involve hypothesis testing? Is it a mistake to commit oneself to hypothesis testing in machine learning uh, when the model of exploratory machine learning is perhaps more suitable? Yeah, I think, um, I don't want to say hypothesis testing is, is, uh, is out 
or um, is no longer useful to us. But I think um, I think this literature on on model based philosophy of science tells us that there's a lot more going on in scientific practice in the scientific method than than sort of um, simple hypothesis testing. Um, a lot of what we're doing is kind of um, uh, heuristic. A lot of what we're doing is kind of fashioning broad nets, right? And, and casting them out to the world and seeing what we draw in. And then, you know, figuring out from scratch what what sticks, you know, figuring out how to deal with it from there. And I think I think more and more these days we're going to see um, with the increased role of machine learning in, in scientific practice, we're going to see more and more that science is, is quite like that and not like we traditionally can see of it. Okay, next next question coming in from uh, Stefan Hesperugen, who asks, actually picking up on your on your question about uh, or your mention near the end of categorizing machine learning. Uh, do all the alleged bugs that you see in, in I like that bugs in quotes, uh, in machine learning apply indiscriminately across uh, the various forms of machine learning? So unsupervised, supervised, or deep machine learning uh, is, do you think there's, there's, a, there's, there's more taxonomizing to be done there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and this is, this is why I think uh, it's it sort of, um, it's very timely that, that we as philosophers of science turn to trying to like understand machine learning um, as quickly as we can, because there's there's just there's such a a, a plethora of, of types of models that come with their own sort of like epistemic pitfalls, right? Um, uh, do I see like a, a if I just think on it right now? Do I see that that some of these forms are more likely to that's something you know I, I I haven't I haven't thought that far yet um but it's something I hope to to be thinking about cool um one more question I see here from uh from Yohan Muntin hey hey Yohan how are you uh, uh says interesting talk with lots of promising ideas I'm curious if if Mel wants to relate the talk to the connection between prediction understanding and explanation so can we get any type of explanation from machine learning models do these models explain anything beyond uh, beyond their ability to predict That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's right. There's a there is a robust literature um, on explainable AI, right? And there is a robust literature on um, like explanation as an epistemic goal in philosophy of science. Um, as far as I know, no one has drawn that connection. Yet, is that true? Has Carlos Sednik drawn that connection? I don't think anyone's drawn that connection yet. I'd love to see that. Um, I think that there's a, again a really fruitful um, area of exploration there. Great. Um... We are out of questions and essentially out of time. So I think this is perfect, uh, perfect, perfect place to uh, perfect place to wrap up. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, and we will be back 